harrowing scenes in hospitals in India as they run out of beds and oxygen supplies under a record surge in cases of COVID-19. Medical staff are at breaking point as they struggle to manage huge numbers of patients with rapidly dwindling resources. If oxygen runs out, there is no, there is no leeway for many patients. There is no leeway. They will die. We'll be reporting from the emergency ward of a hospital in the capital, Delhi, which has been overwhelmed by the numbers. Also tonight. From closest ally to bitter critic, Dominic Cummings launches an explosive attack on Boris Johnson. Vindicated, 39 former post office workers have their convictions quashed in the UK's most widespread miscarriage of justice. The Wales manager and former player Ryan Giggs has been charged with assaulting two women. And care workers reflect on the effect of the pandemic on their personal mental health. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News channel, Chelsea, Spurs, now Arsenal. Fans gather outside the Emirates Stadium calling for change after the collapse of the European Super League. Good evening. The healthcare system in India is collapsing under the pressure of a surging second coronavirus wave, with hospitals full, patients left untreated for hours and supplies of oxygen desperately inadequate. The country of 1.4 billion people, the second highest population in the world, now has more daily cases than anywhere else since the pandemic began. It set a global record for two days running. In the past 24 hours, it's seen 330,000 new cases. Cases. Over 2,000 more people have died in the same period, with severely ill patients being turned away from hospitals which have no more room. India's second wave has accelerated rapidly in just a few weeks to over three times its previous peak. Our Delhi correspondent Yogita Limai, who spent days charting the mounting crisis there, reports now from the emergency ward of one hospital in the capital, and I should warn you that her report contains distressing scenes from the start. The front line, an emergency room in a COVID hospital, just about standing under the weight of an unfolding disaster. A patient who's hardly breathing is brought in. As nurses try to get him to respond, there's another person, even more critical. Manjusha Matthew rushes to help. So many like her are putting in all they can. They couldn't revive him. To get past the shortage of beds, they've packed in stretchers, wheelchairs, as many as they can. But the first line of treatment against COVID-19 is oxygen. And they've almost run out. At this point, there is just one hour of supply left. The staff knows how many lives hang in the balance. People are being turned away, but they don't know where they'll find oxygen or a bed. Manora Bibi was taken in for a short while to stabilize her. We've already been to five hospitals. Where will poor people like us go? Her nephew asks. But this hospital is so on the brink, they have to leave. The intensive care unit is full too. There are next to no ICU beds in a city of 20 million. These are patients in a critical condition. It's it's unthinkable, uh, unimaginable that one would think of them as better off in any way. But it's the reality of what we're seeing in India. People in an ICU have won the first battle to be here. Between seeing his patients, the doctor constantly on calls. Back up, that's another couple of hours. So we are struggling, we are struggling. He's desperately trying to get more oxygen. We are running out of oxygen the whole country is running out of oxygen okay the city is we are everybody is okay so please focus on that please you're doing a fantastic job otherwise okay please okay all of you remember that 
if oxygen runs out, there is no there is no leeway for many patients. There is no leeway. They will die. Day after day, the staff works here, knowing full well that if their families get sick, even they will struggle to find medical care. There is helplessness and anger. The government in some ways failed in estimating what was going to happen, the, need, the needs that would arise if the numbers started rising. There was a sense of preparation in the earlier surge which seems to have, seemed to have disappeared in between. And they did things which was totally unacceptable, allowing large, huge gatherings, which is totally unacceptable. They believed that they, we had vanquished the virus. Some oxygen arrives a bit later, but it can only last a few hours. Then, the struggle begins again. The government says it is trying to speed up the supply of oxygen. Railway trains are being are being used to carry it around the country. Uh, the Air Force has also been pulled in. They're flying empty oxygen tankers to industries that produce the gas so that it reduces the time taken for the oxygen to get to the hospitals that need it. Uh, mobile oxygen production units are also going to be imported from Germany. But this is a crisis that's unfolding right now. Hospitals here running out, having only a few hours of oxygen left. And so many are wondering if this will reach quickly enough to save lives in this city. Yogita, thank you. Yogita Limai there reporting from Delhi. Well, the crisis in India has highlighted how parts of the world are struggling with second, third and even fourth waves, while many European countries, including, of course, the UK, have the virus under control. The availability of vaccines is a key factor, as our health correspondent Catherine Burns reports. India is being called a devastating reminder of what the virus can do. They're burning bodies in mass cremations, volunteers helping with funeral ceremonies. It's been another record day of cases after a dramatic spike over recent weeks. There are almost 20 times more cases now than at the start of March. But around the world, across that time, numbers have been rising. In Turkey, it's six times more. In Argentina, cases have gone up four times. For Iran, it's three times bigger. And in Germany, they're about to start another lockdown because numbers there have more than doubled. It's not good enough to say that inequity is just the way the world is. It's not OK that people just like you and me die when we have the tools that could save them. This map shows how vaccines have been rolled out around the world. It starts off white before any doses are given. As you can see, the United Kingdom is one of the first countries to change colour to light blue. Now, the darker the colour, the more people have been vaccinated. Soon, the United States and other countries follow as almost a billion doses are given out globally, but not everywhere. The lightest bits of the map, like huge chunks of Africa, are either countries where they haven't recorded any data or have vaccinated less than 0.2% of their population. And let's just take the darkest blue bits, the places where more than 20% of people have been vaccinated. You can see how uneven the spread is. Science is only good if you get it to society. And that society, I'm afraid, with the global pandemic is the global society. And we need to get those diagnostics, those treatment, those vaccines critically to countries around the world. It's enlightened self-interest. That's not just because it's the ethical thing to do as we enjoy new freedoms. When virus levels are high, the more likely it is to mutate. And the worry is that new variants could make vaccines less effective. Catherine Burns, BBC News. Here, the latest coronavirus figures show that there were 2,678 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. 2,483 new cases were reported on average per day in the last week. Just over 1,879 people are in hospital. 40 deaths were reported. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, 23 deaths were announced every day. The total number of deaths is now 127,385. 
As for vaccinations, just, uh, just under 131,000 people have had their first dose in the latest 24-hour period, meaning well over 33 million have now had their first dose. The, the take-up for the second jab remains high, with just over 431,000 in the latest 24-hour period, meaning just over 11.6 million are now fully vaccinated. Well, I'm joined now by our health editor, Hugh Pym. Hugh, the situation in India is of huge concern, but how would you assess where we are here now? Well, Rita, there are more optimistic noises from government about the situation in the UK. Boris Johnson said today that looking at the numbers, in his, his view, it continued to look very promising, although there was a need for prudence. Senior officials are indicating they think things are very much on track for the next stage of the roadmap, the next easing in England, May the 17th, including indoor hospitality, some household mixing and even possibly foreign holidays. And as one source put it, things are basically going according to plan at the moment. The data is going the way they'd hoped and predicted. The vaccines, according to this source, are pretty good against the variants. And of course, there's been a good uptake. There's even been talk today of things possibly getting back closer to normal in the summer, possibly masks and face coverings not being required, although they may be needed again in the autumn and winter. If cases pick up, they may be needed on public transport, uh, very possibly. So that's the official view as of now. Some ex experts may disagree, although uh, officials are saying that cases could pick up a bit after May, and there are uncertainties particularly behaviour. Will people carry on following the rules that are still in place? And crucially, will they self-isolate if they do get symptoms and become ill? OK. Hugh, many thanks. Hugh Pym there. The Prime Minister's former chief adviser, Dominic Cummings, has launched a blistering attack on Boris Johnson on a number of fronts after reports that he'd played a part in leaking text messages between the Prime Minister and the businessman Sir James Dyson. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, has more and a warning her report contains flashing images. He left Downing Street last November and he hasn't gone quietly. Dominic Cummings was once the Prime Minister's closest adviser but accused by anonymous number 10 sources of leaking sensitive material, he's launched a ferocious attack on his old boss and those around him. Earlier this week, the BBC published text messages between Boris Johnson and businessman Sir James Dyson. In a blog post, Mr Cummings denied being the leaker and said he'd show senior officials his phone to prove it. This evening, Mr Johnson fended off questions. I, I, I don't think people care. What they care about is... Uh, really what, what, was, uh, what, what was I doing back in March of, of last year? And people have, people have attacked me for that. But did, uh, you, did uh, you finger him as the source of that leak? I, I don't think people give a monkeys, to be frank, right. about, about you know, who's briefing what to him. Mr Cummings has plenty more to get off his chest. The Prime Minister and his fiancée, Carrie Simons, live in a flat in Downing Street. Reports have been swirling about an expensive refurb. And Mr Cummings claims there were question marks over who'd pay for it. He says, I thought his plans to have donors secretly pay for the renovation were unethical, foolish, possibly illegal. A number 10 spokesperson says the government and ministers have acted in accordance with codes of conduct and electoral law on donations. Now cast your mind back to last autumn. The decision to have a second lockdown in England was leaked and an inquiry launched to find out who'd done it. Mr Cummings says Boris Johnson considered stopping that investigation when evidence pointed to one of Carrie Simons' friends. I told him that he could not possibly cancel an inquiry about a leak that affected millions of people just because it might implicate his girlfriend's friends. Tonight, number 10 said the Prime Minister had never interfered in a government leak inquiry. But Labour says there needs to be full transparency about everything that's gone on. Now we've got number 10 officials fighting like rats in a sack about who's to blame rather than how to put things right. And to top it off, really serious allegations levelled against the Prime Minister himself by Dominic Cummings. I think we now need an independent investigation into, uh, into those allegations. Government advisers see and hear a lot of sensitive information. Mr Cummings has gone public with his version of events and Downing Street must decide how hard to fight back.
Now, tonight, Simon Government are trying to downplay all of this, saying Dominic Cummings is disgruntled and discredited. But it can cause real problems for the Prime Minister, uh, I think. Firstly, it could be seen as a reflection on his leadership, presiding over a team that at times in the last few months has looked pretty dysfunctional. There's also a problem because it's a massive distraction. We've had all those allegations about lobbying. This, too, is about standards and conduct in public life. And finally, they can't control this Downing Street. They simply don't know what's coming next. Dominic Cummings suggesting he's kept phone records and no one knows quite what else he's willing to share. Vicky, thank you. 39 former sub post office managers wrongly convicted of theft, fraud and false accounting have been cleared by the Court of Appeal in the most widespread miscarriage of justice ever seen in the UK. The ruling comes more than two decades after people were prosecuted for using a flawed IT system installed by the post office, which suggested that large sums of money had gone missing. Some of them spent time in prison and many saw marriages, jobs and reputations ruined after being wrongly Strongly accused of financial irregularities. Our consumer affairs correspondent Coletta Smith reports. Today was everything they had dared to hope for. Very happy. We were not mad. It's a long time coming. Branded as criminals by their own employer, but they'd done nothing wrong. I've been to prison. Um, prison doesn't do anybody any good. Today is pure emotion. After decades of fighting, these sub postmasters have not only had their convictions quashed, but they've been exonerated by the Court of Appeal. It will have plenty of ramifications, legal implications down the line, but for those today who just received the news, it's overwhelming. 20 years ago, a new computer system was introduced into every branch. Money began to disappear from the accounts. Thousands of pounds were missing, which sub-postmasters simply couldn't explain. The post office charged them with theft and began criminal proceedings. Janet Skinner was sent to prison. Here's what she told me earlier this week. We were all telling the truth, but nobody wanted to listen. Today their voices were heard, and they were praised by the judge as characters of the highest repute. I'm relieved, absolutely relieved. I just started shaking as soon as I started reading out all the names. Do I have to wait 14 years and then to have to actually bring an army against them? Yeah. Karen Wilson had been fighting to clear the name of her husband Julian, who passed away five years ago. And today, her strength won through. I can't quite believe it. It's going to take a long time to sink yeah. in, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is, it is. It's been worth all the trauma and the pain and the agony and the tears we've got there. We've got there and that's the main thing. Basically, we did the government's job. They didn't do anything. Whole families have been impacted. Emma had to step in to help her dad financially when he couldn't get work. As long as he's looking down, feeling proud and feeling, you know, we did it, I told you so, I think, I think that's what we'll take away from it, isn't it? Yeah. The lawyer representing most of today's group says this victory throws open the gates for hundreds more appeals. The words that have been uttered many times over recent years about doing the right thing by these people, uh, the time is now to translate those, deeds into, those words into deeds. The current boss of the post office in a statement said, I'm in no doubt about the human cost of the post office's past failures. The quashing of historical convictions is a vital milestone and there must be compensation that reflects what has happened. But those words can never remove the pain of lost decades. Coletta Smith, BBC News. A murder investigation has been launched after a 14-year-old boy was stabbed to death in East London. Emergency services were called to Barking Road in Newham at around 4 o'clock this afternoon. The teenager was confirmed dead at the scene and the Metropolitan Police says efforts are being made to inform his next of kin. The Wales football manager Ryan Giggs has been charged with assaulting two women in Salford last November. The former Manchester United player has also been charged with one count of coercive and controlling behaviour. He denies any wrongdoing. Our correspondent Andy Swiss is outside Greater Manchester Police headquarters for us and can tell us more. Andy. Well, Rita, Greater Manchester Police say Ryan Giggs has been charged with causing actual bodily harm to a woman in her 30s and with a common assault 
of a woman in her 20s. Now, both charges relate to an incident uh, in November last year when police were called to reports of a disturbance at an address here in Manchester. Uh, he's also been charged with one count of coercive and controlling behaviour and he'll appear at Magistrates Court here in Manchester next week. Now, Ryan Giggs has released a statement. He says, I understand the seriousness of the allegations. I will plead not guilty in court and look forward to clearing my name. Now, Giggs, of course, is a former Manchester United player. More recently, though, he's been the manager of the Wales national team, but he's not been involved since his arrest last year. And the Football Association of Wales say that Robert Page uh, will be in charge when Wales compete in the European Championship this summer, Rita. Thank you very much, Andy. For the past year, people working in residential care and nursing homes have been under extraordinary pressure and for many it's taken a huge toll on their mental health. More than 1,200 care staff took part in research for the GMB union and three quarters of them said their work during the pandemic had a serious effect on their mental well-being. Here's our social affairs correspondent, Alison Holt. Masks, aprons, gloves, they've become a uniform for care workers in their battle against Covid but one that can't protect them against the trauma and loss felt by so many. There's just empty rooms. Five empty rooms out of 12 is, is massive. They actually said we could say goodbye to my husband and I actually thought that's the last time I'm going to see him. Because we're caring for people, I think you automatically assume that people are doing okay and I think nobody ever wants to admit that they're struggling. You're right. More than 1,200 care home and home care staff responded to research by the GMB union. Of those, three quarters say the last year has had a serious effect on their mental health. Georgina's worked with people with dementia at the same home for 30 years. In December, COVID claimed the lives of nearly half the people she looked after. Now even entering their rooms is traumatic. It just triggered such emotions. It did make me stop and think, can I carry on looking after, sorry, people with dementia um, because I, I, I know now I can um, because I've, I've asked for help. So uh, most staff questions say their biggest fear has been that they might take the virus home to family. Joanne, a nurse who runs a rehabilitation unit, developed COVID soon after an outbreak at work. So did her husband. On her wedding anniversary, she was so ill, an ambulance was called. The fact that I was being taken off to hospital, blue lights and everything. I know my husband came to say goodbye, but it really felt like I needed to look at him as, for as long as I could just to get that image in my head. But it really felt like this is it. This is the last time I'm seeing him. In terms of your mental health, do you feel stronger or worn out? But worn down in, in terms of like, I've had enough. <laughs> Can we be over COVID now? Um, and on the other hand, again, there's still that determination that like, let's just plow on, let's get through. But in a sector that struggles to recruit, nearly a fifth of care staff questioned expect to leave their jobs within 12 months. Mark Topps was the manager of a home for people with learning disabilities. His wife had to shield, so she and their young children moved out in case he brought the virus home. He's now quit his job so they can be back together safely. There was a lot of tears. We didn't want to be apart and I think Despite long hours working in social care, we've never been apart since I was you know, 18 years old. I think there's a lot of care staff that are either burnt out or they're very close to burnout. And I think we are going to see a lot of staff eventually, you know, off sick with stress at work. You can't keep that up forever. Although Mark's no longer working on the front line, <laughs> Ioanne is relieved to be back at work after a year that has changed so many lives. Oh, thank you. Alison Holt. BBC News.
Joe Biden's first overseas trip as U.S. president will be to the U.K. for the G7 summit in Cornwall in June. That will be followed by a NATO summit in Brussels as he seeks to reassert America's global leadership amid rising tensions with China and Russia. In recent weeks, both have escalated military activity around Taiwan and Ukraine, respectively. Our World Affairs editor John Simpson has this assessment of the challenge facing the U.S. president. On Russia's border with Ukraine, confrontation suddenly turns into open warfare. But does Russia really intend to invade, given that Ukraine has the backing of America and Europe? 5,000 miles away, a Chinese Air Force video shows their jets racing across the sea near Taiwan, the island which broke away from communist China in 1949. The question is, will China actually invade? What links Russia's moves on Ukraine and China's moves on Taiwan? It's this man. Joe Biden is hugely experienced in foreign affairs, but America isn't any longer the power it once was. The Kremlin is very clearly trying to test the new U.S. administration. The massive buildup in Ukraine's east, this is very much uh, for the Biden administration. Putin made that very clear in his annual speech that he delivered to the Russian people earlier this week where he said there would be severe consequences for any Western power that crosses so-called red lines. There are worrying possibilities. The leading Russian dissident, Alexei Navalny, recently sentenced to two and a half years jail, has announced he's stopping his hunger strike, but he's still very ill, supposing he dies. The way Vladimir Putin's opponents have been murdered has been strongly attacked by President Biden, for instance, last month on ABC News. So you know Vladimir Putin, you think he's a killer? Mm-hmm, I do. Nowadays, Russia and China, though they do have their differences, are combining to show up America's weakness, with China's President Xi Jinping as senior partner. That's what the crises in Ukraine and Taiwan are all about. Rana Mitta is professor of Chinese politics at Oxford University. I think a war between the United States and China in the region is extremely unlikely. Some people have started using the expression not cold war, but hot peace to describe what's going on. And I think that's rather good, because I think that there will be lots of blow-ups in the region in terms of rhetoric and even confrontations that come near to becoming problematic. Hot peace is a useful description. Sometimes, as we've just been seeing over climate change, it suits America, Russia and China to cooperate. But mostly, we can expect a lot more confrontation to come. John Simpson, BBC News. Let's take a look now at some of today's other news. Anti-terror prosecutors in France have taken charge of an inquiry into the fatal stabbing of a female police employee near Paris. Other police officers shot dead her Tunisian attacker after he stabbed her in the throat at the entrance of a police station. Rescue teams in Indonesia believe they have only a few hours left to find 53 sailors on board a missing submarine. The sub disappeared on Wednesday during exercises off Bali and its supply of oxygen is close to running out. Researchers in Britain say early trials of a new malaria vaccine suggest it's 77% effective at stopping infection. The jab could be a major breakthrough against the illness which kills more than 400,000 people a year. Elections take place in England, Scotland and Wales in just under two weeks' time. In Wales, all 60 seats in the Senate are up for grabs. The pandemic has seen devolved administrations take often quite different approaches to tackling Covid and its consequences. Our Wales correspondent Howell Griffith reports now from Rhondda, an area badly hit by the virus. High above the valley, handwritten reminders of lives lost to the pandemic. The Rhondda has suffered one of the worst death rates in the UK, a legacy the community here has to live with. Bev lost her mother, Sheila, in January. The heart was her idea. As she looks to the future, what she wants is lasting help and support. 
Definitely more money is needed for mental health than the Rhonda. You ask any person here, they all know somebody who passed away with coronavirus or, you know, somebody in the family. So it's definitely more help needed here because there's so many people being affected. Helping places like the Rhonda recover is the challenge for whoever governs Wales after next month's election. The post-pandemic years have to address deep-rooted problems. Bev's son-in-law, Brendan, says there has to be more hope and more opportunity. Unfortunately, the majority of the, the young people coming through are going to have to move out of their own this. And unless they're an entrepreneur who want to set up their own business to go and earn those city salaries. Um, I say I've got two children, a 14-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old son, and at the moment I don't really want to encourage them to stay within the Ronda because I think they're going to have a lot more opportunities outside. Over the last year, it's places like the Ronda with high levels of poverty and chronic diseases which have suffered the most in this pandemic. Generational problems that the politicians have always struggled to solve. Traditionally a Labour heartland, the ground has shifted here in recent years. In the last Welsh election, Plaid Cymru took this seat. This time around, the dynamic could be different again. Having a voice in this country is quite a big thing. For the first time, 16 and 17 year olds get to vote. The pandemic frames Lloyd and Ruby's thinking too. We are missing vital and crucial education. They're the groundwork and pathways of our future. And because I haven't had a full year of education, I don't know if I'm going to have the ability or skills to be able to do my A-levels comfortably. Being from the run there, you have this sort of doubt in your mind that you can't make it as big as people would in more city-like areas. That like having more education and more help and more opportunities will help push those people then to go and aim higher. The pandemic may have overshadowed this election, but it's also shone a light on what people here want to change. Howell Griffith, BBC News, in the Ronda. And for more information on all the parties that are standing for election to the Welsh Parliament on the 6th of May, you can go to bbc.co.uk. That's it from us. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a very good night. Bye-bye.